Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Will Pomerand, and I'm Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. And on behalf of Jane Harmon, our CEO and Director, I would like to welcome everyone to today's event on Syria and outside powers, what they want, and can they have it? The Wilson Center is the living memorial to our 28th president, and we pride ourselves in serving as a bridge between the world of academia and the world of policy. We are also able to work across countries and across programs within the Wilson Center and provide analysis from multiple perspectives. And today's event is a great example of how we can facilitate such a dialogue. And I'm so pleased that we are co-sponsoring today's event uh, with the Middle East program. We have a very talented panel today, so I want to proceed to the program as soon as possible. So I will turn the program over to Aaron David Miller who is Vice President for New Initiatives, a distinguished fellow, and Director of the Middle East Program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, for two decades, uh, Aaron served as in the Department of State as an, an analyst, negotiator, and advisor on Middle Eastern issues to Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State. He has written five books, uh, the most recent being The End of Greatness, Why America Does why America Can't Have and Doesn't Want Another Great President, uh, and his articles have appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, he is a regular contributor on CNN and is a commentator on NPR, BBC, and many other news outlets. So, Aaron? Well, thanks so much. The floor is yours. I, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and again, let me welcome you to the <coughs> Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the living memorial to our 28th president, our only PhD president, Woodrow Wilson, and, and the only one buried in Washington uh, so far. We have a terrific panel today, co-sponsored with Kennan, which is an extraordinary preeminent institution dealing with Russia uh, at the center and in, in Washington and, and, ac and across the nation. Um, and we have a terrific panel, and we're going to need their expertise uh, and their wisdom to unpack the subject, the complicated subject that um, that confronts us today. Before I introduce them, briefly, I want to make a few observations in an effort to perhaps frame the discussion. Clearly, as we've watched the horror and tragedy of the Syrian civil war now unfold over the course of the last seven years, the stage has been set now for some time, I suspect, for an expanding role by outsiders. Th this is the conventional wisdom. Sometimes the conventional wisdom has the virtue of being true. And in this case, several developments, including a shrinking ISIS caliphate, um, the evisceration, if not the defeat, of organized uh, and threatening Syrian opposition, and the consolidation of the Assad regime has more or less cleared the underbrush and set the stage for what was uh, involved external powers, uh, five of them, arguably, um, to play a, a, a more expanding role. Three of those power, powers I would consider central, Russia, Turkey, uh, and Iran. And they compete and cooperate in an effort to fo follow and further their own interests. Um, a fourth power, Israel, seems focused more on what it doesn't want to have happen rather than how, how it sees an idealized outcome. And a fifth, and I'll make a few observations, um, uh, on the American role when we conclude, um, is pursuing a, a policy fraught with contradictions, it seems to me, uh, and confusions. The array of external actors uh, seems to be a kind of a coalition of the unwilling, the cynical, the disinterested, the distracted, um, and, the and, um, and the divided determined above all to ensure that their interests take precedence over the idealized conception of a free, independent, pluralistic, and confessionally balanced Syria. And it may well be that if this represents the will of the international community, and I suspect through seven years of Syrian civil war, these are the powers, not the others, that have shaped presumptively what Syria is now uh, and what it may become, it's no wonder that the Syrian civil war ha for has endured for this long. Whether these external powers can achieve their interests and getting into Syria obviously is a lot easier than getting out, uh, remains to be seen. And um, that's why we have such a distinguished and extraordinary panel here today. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. 
Uh, Paul DeConnois is Associate Professor, Department of History and Archaeology at AUB, Beirut. Uh, he served from 05 to 08 as an Assistant Professor in the Department of History at the American University in Cairo. He's held scholarships here at the Wilson Center. Welcome back, Paul. It's a pleasure to see you. His most recent book, I believe, uh, is Alexander Serov and the Birth of the Russian Modern, um, 2015. 16. 16. Good to know, thanks. Robin Wright, uh, known to all of you, is a distinguished fellow at the Wilson Center, a colleague of ours and mine, and the U.S. Institute of Peace. Broad expertise in the region, Islamic extremism, political and military dynamics. She's a longtime writer for The New Yorker, former diplomatic correspondent for The Washington Post, reported for more than 140 countries, and um, has a deep and authoritative expertise, uh, specifically and particularly on, on Iran. Um, she's au also author of the widely acclaimed Rock the Cause by Rage and Rebellion Across the Islamic World. Robin and I also have something in common. We are both graduates. I was there for eight years. Robin was actually born in Ann Arbor of the University of Michigan, so. Go blue. Stage of identification, right. Tune in tonight uh, to the national for the national championship game. Robin, it's great to have you here. David Pollack, a longtime friend and colleague, is the Kaufman Fellow and Director of the FIC Reform, at the Was FIC Reform blog at the Washington Institute. He's had a long career in government, State Department, USIA, served as a senior advisor for the broader Middle East and a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff. He holds a PhD uh, in political science and Middle East studies from Harvard. He's taught there and at GW. Um, he's fluent in Arabic, French, and Hebrew, uh, as well as proficient in several, several, several other regional languages, which is uh, more than the calling card of a... <laughs> Entry, entry into this in, into this region. As someone once remarked, once remarked, Middle East is a, like a university from which one never graduates. And I think David's a, a definitely an example, perhaps even the poster child for that. Although <coughs> perhaps a, some a, a few of us as well. Uh, and then, um, last but not least, uh, is Amy Austin Holmes, who is also an associate professor of sociology at the American University in Cairo. Her research focuses on the intersection of contentious politics and security issues broadly defined. Her book, Social Unrest and American Military Bases in Turkey, Germany Since 45, was published by Cambridge University Press. She's research researching the Kurds, just returned not too long ago, Amy, correct, from the region. So uh, I will be a ruthless moderator in the sense that uh, we have four presenters. Each will speak uh, no more than eight minutes. Uh, I may have an annoying question or two to ask them, and then we will uh, we'll go to your questions. So, uh, Paul, let me begin uh, with you and uh, Russian interests and objectives in Syria and can they achieve them? Well, thank you, Aaron. If I can start with a very non-humanitarian pun, Russian interests in Syria are very much a moving target. <laughs> when the intervention began in September 2015, Russia had as a clearly stated goal, its official goal for public consumption was we want to destroy ISIS and we want to make sure that the regime of Bashar al-Assad is stabilized and free of this threat from ISIS. And what happened within really only hours of that intervention starting was that Russia began to bomb other targets in Syria, the Free Syrian Army, other opponents to Assad who are not necessarily Islamic or radically Islamic and certainly not ISIS. And this continued and continues today uh, moving through various permutations of what Russia may or may not want in Syria. There's been a great deal of speculation, but I think we can narrow this down to a few things. Russia has been terrorized since 2011 by the events of the Arab Spring. Many of the public events, the large protests, the liberalization objectives of these crowds in the Arab world share a lot in common with the opposition within Russia. They're organized through social media. They have as their goal the destabilization of the different regimes in their countries. And this is very, very frightening to post-Soviet states, including Belarus and some of the ones in Central Asia. If you follow their policies, it's quite similar to what's happening in Russia. And you can almost time a crackdown on public expression in Putin's Russia to the events of the Arab Spring, continuing up to the present day. And one by one, every time Russia tried to do something to prevent the collapse of one of these Arab regimes, whether it was Ben Ali's in uh, Yemen or the, the Gaddafi's regime in, in Libya, they found themselves defeated, strategically checked, 
ignored by the United Nations, ignored by the West, and they found this to be quite humiliating, like they didn't matter in Middle Eastern politics. And they were also losing very real assets. Russia had base agreements with Libya, with Yemen, and of course, longstanding from the days of the Cold War with uh, Assad Syria. And in the cases in which the regimes fell, Russia lost those base rights. It lost its penetration of their oil development facilities. It lost a lot of its opportunities for economic investment. And trying to repair that relationship to restore those positions is something that's been very important to Putin. Now, in Syria, of course, they want to prevent th the collapse of the regime, but they also want to protect their base rights in Latakia, the great naval base at Tartus. Well, not so great naval base at Tartus, but nevertheless, it's there. Uh, and also now their air bases of elsewhere in Syria. And they regard that as a very important goal and something that they're very much willing to stand up to the West against. And in the Obama administration, they had a very weak opponent. In 2013, Obama drew his famous infamous red line saying that he would intervene in Syria and the United States would intervene in Syria if Assad used chemical weapons. The Russian diplomatic demarche was to try to get an agreement, a sort of disarmament agreement by which Assad would surrender his weapons to international authorities or at least not use them and the Americans wouldn't intervene. Well, guess what happened? The United States didn't intervene. <laughs> Assad used the chemical weapons anyway and nothing happened until the Russians themselves intervened militarily on his behalf, emboldened by the lack of any Western response, any serious Western response at that time. Since 2015, the Russians have been attacking the different sources of opposition to Assad, including humanitarian assets. There have been bombings of hospitals, of relief convoys, of uh, so supplying of, of arms to the regime that are then used in really terrible ways. And what Putin wants, again, it's been anybody's guess, but what it seems to be is regime stabilization and a significant role in whatever peace process eventually ends this conflict. Uh, I think we can also know, and this is something that's only come up in the last few weeks, that r if there is to be a, a lasting peace solution in Syria, Russia is also interested economically in being a part of that recovery effort because you see a large emphasis, emphasis now on Russian firms that want to rebuild the destroyed and damaged areas of Syria and to do as much as they can to get those contracts. Now, I'm not naming names, but a lot of Lebanese contractors are already getting involved in this and making sure that um, they have some piece of that as well. But that's clearly one of the Kremlin's current goals. Now, can they actually pull this off? It seems to face significant limitations. The Russian state media, if you follow that, and its apologists in other countries, including countries in the Middle East, really emphasized the strength of Russian power, that they argued that Russia was quite decisive in this conflict, that it would bring an end to ISIS. And the reality, of course, is quite different. Much of the damage given to ISIS was, in fact, done by the American forces and their Kurdish and Iraqi surrogates, uh, supported very much by American arms. Uh, the Russian intervention was airborne, and its ground operations have been quite limited. Russia has been very reluctant to place boots on the ground, at least official boots on the ground. And most of its uh, uh, combat operations in Syrian territory are limited to sort of paramilitary organizations, much like Triple Canopy or Blackwater, if you're familiar with America and Iraq, except they have, the Russian ones have actual combat roles. And who are these people? Well, from the best reports we have, they go under the strange name of uh, Wagner after the famous composer, happens to be a favorite of one of the Russian nationalists who organizes this, somebody with very close Kremlin ties. These are recycled veterans from the infiltrations of Crimea in eastern Ukraine, people with a nationalist bent. Uh, you could describe them as mercenaries sent into Syria in their thousands and not at all acknowledged by the government, with operating with tremendous plausible deniability. And the most recent and dramatic case of this, what they attacked Deir Ezzur, uh, an oil facility that was protected by American forces and lost dozens if not hundreds of casualties. The Kremlin, of course, in the lead up to the recent presidential election in Russia, denied any involvement, didn't acknowledge them as formal casualties. There were no pictures of body bags being brought back to Russia. And this eventuated some public scandal in the international media, but very little was actually reported in the Russian press by design. Right? Russia they want to have maximum possible effect in Syria, but with the, maximum poss the minimum possible liability in terms of losses that they have to explain to their public and also the potential for confrontation with the West. I think we see the limitations of Russian power quite clearly in that Assad's regime still remains relatively more stable than it was, say, five years ago, but certainly not at all in control of much of the country, 
facing significant opposition that has not been destroyed and probably won't be destroyed, and a Russian policy that now has settled on de facto spheres of influences. Uh, the dividing line we were just talking about before is the Euphrates. And the Americans have the Iraqi side of the Euphrates, and the Russians are supposed to be on the other side, but there are disputes and contention about where that begins and ends. And also recently in the diplomatic talks, the Russians have been talking about having autonomous zones of control within Syria, where local militias or the Kurds, for example, will have autonomous power in regions of Syria that the government can't control. Now, that's problematic for a number of reasons. The Russians do officially favor the territorial integrity of Syria, but at the same time, whether Assad will agree to allow external powers to parcel out his country into spheres of influence is something very, very different. Uh, this could also run afoul of Russia's new rapprochement with Turkey, which opposes any kind of autonomy for the Kurdish groups whom they identify with the PKK, which is a Marxist organization dedicated to the destruction of the Turkish state. And this could complicate Russian involvement there in the future. So I really don't think Russia has achieved its stated goals. I, or ISIS was eradicated by somebody else. Resolving the question in the regime's favor has been elusive. And the future portents that you see in the diplomacy don't suggest any sustainability for a unilateral Russian solution or even a solution that has a significant Russian role in it. So I think, I'm, I'm, am I under my eight minutes? Paul is right. economical and very enlightening. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank Robin, you over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I was in Russia six weeks ago uh, looking at just this question, Syria and the Russian and, and Iranian alliance, and I thought it might be very useful to um, put this in perspective, not just in terms of politics and the moment, but in terms of geography and history. So I have uh, uh, a number of maps. And the first one is to, to illustrate this interesting alliance between Moscow and Tehran, which in the past has been tactical, militarily, practical, economically, and cold and calculating when it came to diplomacy. But one of the interesting things that has happened because of Syria and also because of U.S. policy recently is that this has developed into a strategic partnership. And they are very unlikely allies given the long history of animosity between Russia, the old Soviet Union, and Iran, uh, both during the Shah and dur under the Islamic Republic, um, given the fact the Cold War actually started in, uh, in the tensions between the two countries. But now it has evolved into something bigger that I think we ought to take into account when we look at what happens to Syria and the rippling repercussions across the region. So Aaron asked the basic question of what is it that that Iran wants. And again, we in the West have talked a lot about Iran and the so-called Shiite Crescent, which was a term that was first used uh, by King Abdullah in an interview he did with me in 2004. In the immediate aftermath, his office called and said, no, 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 you can't use that term. And I said, you know, it's too late. Those are the rules of engagement are on the record. You can't say, say after the fact, but who knew that it was going to take off like this? But what it's useful to understand is that while there is real concern, as I'll show you later, over the Shiite Crescent stretching from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut, that the Iranians look at it from a very different perspective. And that is that what they call the Sunni circle. That as a minority religion, minority ethnically, that they feel surrounded by Sunnis, by other, other ethnicities. And as the Iranians often tell me, all the way up to the foreign minister and the national security advisor, Iran feels strategically lonely. And again, this is not to say they are, but this is their perspective on the region. So, um, and the reason you know, one of the things that's s always fascinating to me is why Iran became Shiite. And this is one thing to really understand. And it has nothing to do with religious dogma. Iran did not, was a Sunni country until, for the first millennium. It did not become a Shiite country until the 16th century. And it was because of a political decision. They were afraid of the expanding Ottoman Empire. And so they politically decided that to keep the Sunnis in the, in the em, uh, Ottoman Empire from spreading their tentacles into Persia, that they would 
convert the country to Shiism. And the way they did that was to turn to the Shiite clerics in Lebanon, which is an alliance that survives to this day as a core part of their identity, their survival. And it was the Shiite clerics who helped them set up new seminaries to make the conversion, which took more than a century. And, uh, and it, it kind of explains why there is this ferocious loyalty to the Shiites of, of Lebanon. Um, so Syria, in, from Iran's perspective, is in many ways, it is a tool, an instrument, to protect the, the Shiites of Lebanon. It is an interme intermediary geographically, and it is a tool politically. There is very little invested in Bashar Assad. There is a lot invested in Syria as a property for the Iranians, and that's why they will invest so much. Now, one of the things they do share with Russia is that Syria is the only Arab ally, long-standing Arab ally that they really have. Russia has diversified uh, since the end of the Cold War, the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, Iran hasn't for a lot of obvious reasons. Now, this was all reinforced, of course, by the presence of ISIS. And ISIS on Iran's border came within 25 miles. And so this, again, accentuated this the same kind of phenomena of the Ottoman Empire. You know, you have the encroaching Sunni caliphate threatening their security. And of course, ISIS also went into the Kalamun Mountains of Lebanon so that uh, whether it was across Syria and Iraq into on the Iranian border or threatening the Shiites in Lebanon, there was a sense that this was a strategic threat and it exacerbated and justified Iran's intervention uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, in the same way they look at the Taliban in Afghanistan as a threat on one border, they see ISIS on the other. And again, it goes back to the whole idea of the Sunni circle. So, and this, of course, has been further compounded by the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which for, at the end of the day, is not, again, about dogma. This is really about political influence in the region. And in some ways, it's about who's the closer ally with the United States. Uh, until 1979, the Iranian Revolution, Iran and Israel were the two pivotal pillars of U.S. foreign policy. After 79, Saudi Arabia and Egypt took the place of Iran, facilitated by Egypt's walking away from the Soviet Union, making peace with Israel, and Saudi Arabia because of its strategic importance with the, the hike in the price of oil. And in many ways, Saudi Arabia feels very threatened in the aftermath of the Iran nuclear deal that Iran, as a more pop, a bigger consumer base, a more strategic property, a bigger military, would be a more attractive ally. And so what we see play out, whether it's over Syria, um, that this, this tension between the two major powers in the Gulf is really over influence. Now, uh, back to the question of what Iran wants. There's no question that this is a very important ally for both countries. But at the end of the day, the Iranians have advocated since 2015 a four-point peace plan that called for, first, an immediate ceasefire. Secondly, a transition government to be put in place. Third, a constitution to be written that would have as its anchor protection for minorities. And that's a really interesting perspective. Uh, fifth, then UN supervised election. But the goal overall is to keep Syria as one country. The territorial integrity of Syria is pivotal. It wants, like many in the West, want to keep Syria and Iraq as constituted um, for the last century. This is really pivotal in understanding its goals. Now, at the same time, it is true, Iran is building a land bridge and wants that kind of connection uh, in the same way Russia does. They want access to the Mediterranean. They want influence across the region. For the Iranians, there's also that protection and the um, 
access to Hezbollah, to the Lebanese Shiites. Extends beyond Hezbollah, but that's the group that has the biggest, uh, is the biggest single factor. Um, it, it, Iran's role has grown. Uh, the price, the higher the price they pay, the greater the pressure to have something to show for it. And, and particularly because the price that the Islamic Republic is paying is growing. Uh, I make a habit, I cover wars and have all of my life, and I make a point of going to the cemeteries to count the number of dead. And I've done that in both Tehran and at the Hezbollah cemeteries in Lebanon. And you know there are over eight generals who died within the first couple of years of Iran's deployment. They've provided the ground forces in a way the Russians have pro pro provided the air power. They have been pivotal. Uh, at a certain point, the cost became so high to the Revolutionary Guards, they brought in the conventional army, and even more importantly, a lot of militias uh, formed from Pakistanis and Afghan refugees in Iran. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, at least 2,000, and some now say closer to 3,000 Hezbollahis have died. Over 10,000 <coughs> have been injured. That's large for a, a population that that's small. And given the protests in Iran over the price, it's, it's very important for the regime to be able to say, we have secured our place in the region. Now, I, I don't think at the end of the day they're wedded to Assad. I think they'll take anyone. But it gets back to the question of, do you want to see a Sunni power in control, one that could be uh, threatening to Iran's interests that might side with Saudi Arabia or the Gulf. And so Iran looks at in its investment as one that has long-term st long strategic value, is worth the, worth the investment, and I think it'll stay around for a very long time. Robin, thanks. Very comprehensive. Well, uh, Amy Austin Holmes, uh, you're going to tell us about Turkey. You could keep that map. That would be helpful. <laughs> um, Over to you, Amy. Okay, no, it's fine. All right, thank you very much for the uh, introduction um, and the invitation to uh, speak here. So Turkish policy towards Syria is also a moving target. Um, if we look at just the period of um, Erdogan uh, since he came to power in late 2002, we can roughly divide AKP policy towards the ruling Justice and Development Party into three phases. Um, uh, first, the zero problems with your neighbors phase, which is sort of seems like a century ago, but that was actually between 2002 and 2011 under Foreign Minister Ahmed Davut Olu. Um, this was when Turkey was really trying to diversify its uh, relationship, not just you know, to rely too much on the United States and the West or the EU, but to uh, build better and closer ties to other countries in the region, including to Syria. And actually, Davut Olu along with his Syrian counterpart, Walid Mu'allim, had secured a, you know, trade agreements and even uh, visa-free travel between Turkey and, and Syria during this time. Um, <coughs> this um, changed quite dramatically uh, when the Arab revolutions began in 2011 or late 2010 in Tunisia. So there was then an expectation um, that not just in Turkey, but I think also here in the United States and elsewhere in, in the Middle East, that um, Bashar al-Assad would fall as quickly as Ben Ali in Tunisia and Mubarak in Egypt. Um, that obviously did not happen. And secondly, there was an expectation, or I think Erdogan hoped that perhaps Turkey could serve as a model for other countries in the Arab world. If you recall, there were people talking at the time about a Turkish model for the Arab world. Um, so, you know, the idea that countries um, like Egypt, Tunisia, Syria would eventually, you know, engage in some kind of democratization or modernization, liberalization, as had happened in uh, Turkey. Um, this then suddenly, uh, you know, Erdogan's position vis-a-vis -vis, um, Syria changed quite dramatically, and they began advocating a policy of regime change in Syria. Um, <coughs> so, 
this also coincided the last period of this you know, regime change phase from 2011 until 2016 when David Olu resigned. Um, there was also a very crucial interlude or mini period within this overall period um, where there was a ceasefire between the PKK and the Turkish military. Um, that was between roughly, it began in 2012 under Erdogan's leadership. And so we have to remember Erdogan initiated a ceasefire with the PKK. And the ceasefire held from 2013 until 2015. Um, now, historically, um, <coughs> the PKK has had an interesting relationship with Syria. Um, it was founded in the late 1970s, and Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of the PKK, actually escaped into Syria even before the 1980 military coup. Um, and the 1980 military coup um, in Turkey you know, happened after the 1961 coup, the 1970 coup, but then the 1980 coup was in many ways sort of the most had, had, had the biggest impact on Turkish society in terms of really crushing, attempting to crush all forms of, you know, leftist, but also um, right-wing activism, let's say, um, but particularly tra targeting leftist groups and the PKK. The PKK, however, survived partly because Öcalan um, was able to um, live within Syria um, until 1998. So you had Öcalan living in Syria from the late 1970s when he, when he left Turkey until 1998 when he was expelled, when he came under pressure. Um, and he was expelled and since then he's been held in a maximum security prison in Imrala, in the island of Imrala in Turkey. Um, <coughs> so during this regime change period within Syria, right, this sort of uh, period when Erdogan was talking about the nece necessity for you know, Assad to be removed, um, there was a ceasefire with the PKK from 2013 to 2014. That's important to remember. Um, then in 2016, things changed again when David Olu was resigned and the Turkish military began an intervention in Syria. So that was the Euphrates Shield intervention that began in August 2016 um, and lasted until March 2017. Um, during this, okay, we don't have the map anymore, but the Euphrates Shield intervention, um, <coughs> was essentially, and this is what Erdogan you know, wants now, and um, is to prevent the creation of a contiguous swath of territory in northern Syria along the Turkish border that is autonomous of the regime in Damascus and that is where you have a predominantly Kurdish population living. Now, um, the forces of the Assad regime withdrew from northern Syria in July 2012, and since then, this predominantly Kurdish population has established local governance, like a local governance model in, in the north, in Kobani, in, um, <coughs> in sort of the middle, and Jazeera Canton or Al Hasaka in the, in the east, and Afrin in the west. Um, I happened to be in Kobani in 2015. This is when I began my research on the YPG um, and the YPJ. These are the, the Kurdish um, militias, the People's Protection Units or Women's Protection Units. Um, that have been reported about quite a bit in, in, the, in the media, and which have now become part of the Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, which are cooperating with the United States um, in the fight against the Islamic State, and they have actually been our best allies and our most reliable partner on the ground. Um, and they're probably the reason why we could you know, liberate Raqqa as quickly as we did um, in other parts of Syria. Um, <coughs> so, Erdogan intervened, the Turkish military intervened in the Euphrates Shield 2016 in order to prevent the connection of Kobane and Afrin. Uh, so he wanted to pr prevent basically the creation of a continuous zone in the, in the north of um, Syria. Um, and, but it's the Turkish military cooperating with a range of Syrian Arab militias on the ground, sometimes referred to as the Free Syrian Army, um, but there is actually a whole range of um, groups that are quite, you know, Islamist-leaning in their ideology, which Turkey has been uh, cooperating with um, in, these, in these operations. So the Euphrates Shield Operation 2016-17 prevented the connection of these cantons in the north of um, Syria. And then the so-called Olive Branch Operation began in January 2018, on January 20 of this year. Um, now, Erdogan had actually in originally agreed to cooperation, that agreed to U.S. cooperation with the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, as long as it was tactical, 
um, did not arm the YPG directly. And as long as you know, this SDF was created, which includes also Arabs, of course, right? So you have Kurds and Arabs within the SDF. Um, however, after President Trump began arming the YPG directly for the liberation of Raqqa, you know, Erdogan saw this as a red line that was crossed. Um, and again, so these were two of his sort of conditions, again, that the US not w arm the YPG directly and um, that the Kurds don't control this continuous swath of territory. Um, <coughs> now, what, what has happened in this recent um, intervention in Afrin, um, you know, I personally find quite shocking. I mean, I visited, you know, northern Syria, as Erin mentioned, just um, two weeks ago. I just came back two weeks ago. I was in there in, in mid-March when this operation was happening. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, I witnessed myself how families, for example, were trying to get their, their family members out of Afrin as it was slowly being encircled by hostile forces. Smugglers are charging about $1,000 per person to get people out of Afrin. I met a young Kurdish businessman who was trying to get nine family members out. That means $9,000. That's an astronomical sum of money in Syria. Um, they really felt abandoned and isolated and, um, you know, especially given the fact that we have relied on the Kurds for um, fighting the Islamic State. Um, so although, you know, Erdogan claims that this intervention is about targeting the YPG, in fact, it goes much further than that. And there are much more serious consequences because obviously the civilian population is also being targeted, not just the YPG. And the civilian population in Afrin is predominantly Kurdish, but it's also, there are also Yazidis, there are also Christians. Um, now, if you recall in 2014, in Iraq, Sinjar was actually on the map that Robin just showed us. The Yazidis in Sinjar already suffered a genocidal assault by the Islamic State in 2014. Um, now, the Yazidis in Afrin are essentially going through the same thing again. I mean, because of this recent Turkish intervention, they've been displaced again in Afrin. Um, and so the civilian population has suffered. There are 150,000, possibly 200,000 people that have had to you know, been fled just from Afrin. Um, but not only are the civilians being targeted, but this local model of self-governance that they have created is also, at, you know, under assault. And, you know, I visited a number of the, you know, local government uh, groups and, and, and NGOs that exist in, in Kamishle in the, in the east, right? I didn't go to Afrin. It was not possible when, when I was there. Um, but, you know, I just want to say, there's a lot we could talk about this local governance model. It's sometimes referred to as the Rojava revolution. Rojava meaning uh, West, so Western Kurdistan. Um, you know, if we look at all four parts of Kurdistan in Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria, Rojava being in Syria. Um, so the, um, the, what we, you know, see or talk, what's been talked about in, 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 the, in the Western media is the Rojava revolution. Unfortunately, it doesn't get a lot of very, you know, substantive coverage, but, you know, we see these images of the, you know, young Kurdish women toting the Kalashnikovs, but, like, who are they really? What are they really doing? Um, in fact, you know, they have passed a number of important laws in this autonomous region of Syria in the north um, that, for example, have outlawed polygamy. They have outlawed underage marriage. They've set the legal age of marriage at 18. Um, and, you know, although the critics of this would say, well, this is all, you know, PKK propaganda or whatever, actually, if you look at the laws and what they've actually done, you know, setting a legal age of marriage at 18, this is the same thing as you find in the Turkish civil code, right? Legal, legal <laughs> the illegal age of marriage in Turkey is also set at 18. Um, you know, I think you can get the consent of a judge to marry at 17, but my point is that if you actually look at the laws and what they've done in terms of women's rights, you know, there is similarity, in fact, between <laughs> these laws that they've passed and the local government models and the, the, what the local government there is trying to uh, um, implement and Turkish, the own, Turkey's own civil code regarding um, women's rights. And, but, so, but all of this is at risk because of this olive branch uh, operation, so-called olive branch operation in Afrin. And finally, I believe that it also is, of course, a problem for our cooperation with the SDF. Um, that so basically, this Turkish war on Afrin threatens the civilian population, their own local government, as well as the anti-ISIS uh, coalition. Um, but this is what, you know, I think Erdogan, you know, wants to achieve, frankly. I mean, he's not just targeting the YPG, but he's actually targeting Afrin um, 
as a whole and trying to prevent um, the connection to, uh, to the other parts of Kurdish, you know, Syria. Um, and I don't know if there's going to be an open-ended Turkish military presence in the north, um, you know, Aleppo governorate, I don't know, but um, I think that will depend a little bit on what happens in, in Damascus and uh, Tehran, I think, is also not too happy about the idea of a permanent Turkish <laughs> military presence in, in Syria, but that's uh, where we are now, and uh, Erdogan is threatening to march towards Manbij, where there are, of course, American troops and um, SDF troops. Amy, thank you. Your, your on-the-ground uh, insights are really fascinating. David, okay. what does Israel want? Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here on this very difficult subject. Um, and I would say that um, I was asked to talk about, I'll start with this, I was asked to talk about what does Israel want out of the conflict with Syria. And some people would say the question answers itself because what Israel wants is out of the conflict with Syria. In other words, to stay out of the conflict with Syria as much as possible. There's a lot of truth in that, I think, and that, if you had to summarize Israel's interests and Israel's policy in the last seven years or so since the Syrian uprising began uh, exactly seven years ago, um, that would be a pretty fair bumper sticker summary. But I have two qualifications. One is that this is changing, even as we speak. Until now, compared to Russia or Iran or Turkey, Israel's involvement in Syria has been relatively limited. But there's a very good chance that it's going to get bigger as uh, the next few months and years proceed. And secondly, even Looking back at Israel's policy over the last seven years, Israel has intervened in small ways, but important ways, in the Syrian conflict in order to secure what it sees as its basic interests. So what are these basic interests? How has Israel intervened until now, and how is it likely to intervene, in my view, probably more in the future? The basic interests, as Israel sees them, are as follows. And number one is one that's often forgotten, but it, it shouldn't be forgotten, and that is keep the Golan Heights. Israel has occupied that piece of Syrian territory since the Six-Day War in 1967, and uh, almost lost it and then regained it in the October War of 1973, and then formally annexed that territory in 1980. And there is no sign uh, that Israel has any intention of ever giving it up. Uh, on the contrary, there's every sign that this is now considered a crucial buffer zone for Israel's security. This is not an issue of religious uh, claims or settlers. Uh, for the most part, this is an issue of security as the Israelis see it. And it's very much an issue. This is not just history, because today, right now, Israel's control or secure control over that part of originally Syrian sovereign territory called the Golan Heights is in jeopardy by the presence of Iranian and Hezbollah and regime and other forces right on the ceasefire line between the Golan Heights under Israeli control and the rest of Syria under everybody else's control. So that's number one. Number two, related to keep the Golan Heights, is reduce the presence and the threat of hostile forces in Syrian territory, especially close to Israel, especially ones that could pose a significant threat to Israeli security as the Israelis see it. Those forces are the ones I just mentioned, Iran, Hezbollah, regime forces, plus a number of various uh, jihadi militias that have sometimes on and off ventured close to Israeli-controlled territory in the Golan Heights or on other in other uh, border areas. Uh, number three, particularly, when it comes to these security threats, oppose, if necessary, by force, and this is where we're coming to Israel's direct intervention in the Syrian conflict, oppose the transfer of advanced weapons 
to those hostile groups on Syrian territory near Israel's borders or the creation of weapons factories <coughs> that could produce advanced weapons like missiles uh, or anti-aircraft weapons, um, especially guided missiles or anti-aircraft weapons. Oppose any infiltration across the border or any border skirmishes, uh, whether accidental or deliberate, by anyone from Syrian territory into Israeli-controlled territory. And oppose the use or transfer of unconventional weapons, particularly chemical weapons, to anyone who might threaten Israel's security from Syria. And finally, and this is where I think uh, we get to the question of where we're going to go from here, oppose the creation by Iran and Hezbollah over time of a whole new front against Israel, similar to the one that Iran and Hezbollah have created over time in Lebanon. That means many thousands of missiles, underground bunkers and tunnels, uh, command and control centers, all targeted at Israel. In the event that Iran or Hezbollah decide to use those facilities uh, against Israel, whether in retaliation for an Israeli strike against Iran or for some other reason. I want to tell two very quick anecdotes that I think from my own experience actually on the ground um, in this context that I think illustrate some aspects of what I just said. It so happens that I was in Israel in uh, the very moment that uh, Obama decided not to enforce by force the chemical weapons red line that he had announced. This was in September of 2013. And it so happened that at that very moment, I was deep in conversation with a rather senior Israeli security official with responsibility for uh, this issue, among others. And to my amazement, uh, when I asked him what he thought about Obama's decision not to use force, not to enforce the chemical weapons red line, but to turn it over to the Russians and the Assad regime in exchange for promises to get rid of Syria's chemical weapons, this Israeli senior official said to me, you know, this might turn out better for us if Obama manages to get the Syrian regime to divest itself of most of its most dangerous chemical weapons without firing a shot, then he's some kind of a genius. This goes very much against the conventional <laughs> wisdom <laughs> that Israel wanted the United States to intervene by force in Syria or to topple the Assad regime or to get rid of even just that regime's chemical weapons in order to protect the Israelis. Quite the contrary. Israeli policy all during this period has been to look after its, and only after, its narrow, immediate border security interests and not to get involved unnecessarily, in their view, against the regime, against anyone else acting in Syria, whether it was Turkey or Russia uh, or the Kurds, and uh, basically to stay out as much as possible, even to the point of supporting an American policy, at least privately supporting an American policy of very, very limited involvement in the Syrian conflict. And here's another example from, uh, again, from my personal experience uh, a little bit more recently. And this was about two years after that in the uh, late 2015, early 2016 period right after or soon after the Russians had intervened in a more serious way in support of the Assad regime. At that moment, Israel, which had quietly been establishing informal, unofficial contacts with the Syrian opposition as a way of hedging its bets, just in case Assad did fall, was at the point of inviting for the first time a significant delegation, this has not been <laughs> publicly reported until now, 
a significant delegation of Syrian opposition figures to Israel for the first time for a private conference. And there were some people in Israel who considered this an important achievement, at least potentially, as again, a way of hedging their bets because nobody really knew and nobody still knows what is going to end up uh, in Syria. And at that moment, the then Israeli Minister of Defense personally intervened and said, cancel the conference, disinvite the delegation. We, Israel, do not want to be involved with the Syrian opposition in any way, shape, or form. Just at the moment when Russia is intervening forcibly in order to support the Assad regime. So that's basically Israel's policy, limited intervention only to protect its immediate interests and avoiding getting tangled up in the broader Syrian conflict, whether it's against anybody or for anybody on the larger, in the larger arena. And the way that they've done this is with airstrikes. There have been over 100 in just the last two years, and this was publicly uh, acknowledged by the Israeli government, and for the first time today, publicly acknowledged by the Syrian government on its official website, the Syrian Arab News Agency, by engaging in very intensive, continual consultations with all of the major parties involved in Syria, except for Iran and the regime and Hezbollah. In other words, with the Kurds, with the opposition, with the United States, with Russia, and with Turkey, quietly but effectively, including reaching agreements to deconflict certain areas right on Israel's border in the southwest corner of Syria that abuts Israel, the Golan Heights, and Jordan. And engaging in small scale, but increasingly, I would say, substantial humanitarian assistance to Syrian civilians just across the border in order to try and keep the population friendly and less disposed to swing over to the side of the regime, of Iran, of Hezbollah, of the jihadis, or of anybody else that might directly threaten Israel. But all of these precautions and initiatives, limited as they have been, are eroding right now. And that's why, as I said at the start, I think there's every possibility that Israeli intervention in Syria might grow in the coming months and years. Let me just list a few of the ways in which these interests are eroding right now. First of all, Israeli airstrikes have not prevented Iran or Hezbollah from increasing their presence in Syria. They have taken out some convoys, some factories, some specific weapons, even some Iranian generals. But Iran and Hezbollah continue to pour money and weapons and people into increasingly sensitive areas right near Israel on the Syri in Syrian territory. And there is no sign according to the best Israeli and American expert assessments that limited airstrikes of the kind that we've seen up until now are going to score more than tactical successes against those potential enemies. Strategically, Iran and Hezbollah in Syria, as the Israelis see it, pose an increasing threat, not one that can be successfully managed as in the future as it has been in the past. Secondly, the United States, as the Israelis see it, is not inclined to intervene itself in order to prevent this expanding Hezbollah and Iranian encroachment in Syria, which the Israelis see as potentially posing not just a nuisance, but a serious future threat to Israel, maybe even if the Iranians actually succeed in turning Syria into another Lebanon, an existential threat. <coughs> the United States, as the Israelis see it, is not likely to intervene, and therefore, as very senior Israeli officials uh, 
told us at the Washington Institute exactly a week ago, Israel sees itself as on its own when it comes to protecting its narrow interests, even its narrow interests in the future of Syria. And therefore, and I'll wrap up with this uh, rather, I don't want to say alarmist, but troubling conclusion. Therefore, I do expect in the future that we will probably see more Israeli military intervention in the Syrian theater. David, thank you. Um, it's a transi good transition uh, to allow me to make a few observations about U.S. policy. Originally, I had given some thought as to whether or not we needed to address this in a full-blown manner. Um, with some hesitation and reservation, I decided not to. Um, uh, maybe that was the right call, maybe it wasn't. But um, I want to pick up on your point, because the way David frames Israeli policy, I would describe it as risk-averse, narrowly defined and focused, not interested in mega-involvement. I would argue to you that that is precisely the way the United States now, through two administrations, has conceptualized and framed its um, approach to Syria. Now, we are a year into a very mercurial, idiosyncratic, and unpredictable administration. We are now going to witness personnel changes that arguably could change that frame of reference, that risk aversion, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, and an event, perhaps the walking away from or the further delegitimizing or degrading of the JCPOA might in fact expand the potential uh, for American kinetic action. But if you ask me to, to take a look at uh, both the Obama administration's policies and this administration's policies, I would have to say that the point of departure uh, is a, an extraordinary degree, despite all of the blustery rhetoric, of risk aversion. Uh, in a galaxy far, far away, you could have imagined, uh, and rhetorically, the both administrations have use this sort of language. We're going to find a way to check Iranian influence. We're going to find a way to either work with or make it clear to the Russians what exactly we need from them. We are going to use our own military power in the face of mass killing. Um, this administration delivered on its own self-declared red line in April of last year, even though it's allowed scores of, of um, instances of the use of chemical weapons, largely chlorine, against civilian populations as recently as uh, during the last two weeks. So the assumptions on which the previous administration based its policy, and this one, I think are quite strikingly similar. One, Syria is not a vital strategic interest for the United States, and it is not worth an investment of American lives, treasure, and credibility. Second, the shadow of Iraq weighs very heavily and very long. And in fact, Iraq may well be an inflection point, not just for, was for Mr. Obama, and clearly for Mr. Trump, it may well prove to be an inflection point for successive administrations against the investment in trillion dollar social science experiments where the United States seeks to deploy massive military force, spend trillions of dollars in an effort to somehow reconstruct societies where they don't have the wherewithal or the allies on the ground, let alone the will and arguably the skill to do so. Humanitarian intervention, which the Obama administration wrestled with and was accused by its critics to this day of abdication of moral and ethical responsibility in the face of mass killing. And I would only suggest that this administration, even though it responded once, uh, with a single strike against a Syrian airfield, which is the point of departure for those Syrian aircraft that dropped that, th those sa that sarin gas, this administration has shied away from the moral, ethical um, dimensions, even rhetorically. And the reality is that American intervention in the face of mass killing has been the exception, not the norm. From the Nazi Holocaust to Cambodia to Rwanda to Darfur to Congo to Syria to Myanmar, the United States has not, let alone the international community, interceded in any of these situations. So applying an unrealistic and unreasonable standard 
to either the Obama or the Trump administration with the expectation that they would in fact intercede when none of their predecessors <coughs> did, I think simply reinforces the notion that we're not going to get involved. Finally, let me, let me just conclude with this observation. Um, as David had mentioned with respect to the Israelis who have defined their interests very narrowly, we too have defined ours narrowly as well. In fact, the very reason that we got involved in S Syria in a kinetic way uh, had nothing to do with the Assad regime. It had to do with what was perceived to be the potential threat of a transnational terrorist group creating a quasi-caliphate and uh, using the most brutal and gruesome of methods uh, and posing a potential threat to the continental United States, which is still arguably the reason that we are there. Whether this will change, as David pointed out, with respect to the Israelis, it may well expand to the <coughs> Israelis. Whether it will change with respect to our role is another matter, and it's, it's unclear. Bureaucratically, it strikes me as uh, there's a high probability that, in fact, there will be arguments made for the mind of the president um, that would argue for a more kinetic and a more assertive policy. Whether others, Jim Mattis and reality, the fact that there are very few good military options, even if we chose to apply force in Syria with respect to uh, an outcome is, is unclear. So let me conclude, we'll, it is now we have plenty of time for discussion among our panelists and plenty of time for questions for the, from the audience. But let me pose a question to each of you because I was thinking as I listened to each of you. Uh, Paul, for you, and I know this is impossible to answer, but when Putin, try my best. When Putin thinks of Assad, how does he, what do you think the thought process is with respect to replacing him? Um, ensuring that he or other Alawis continue who have some encumbrance or, or debt to the Russians. How does he conceptualize maintaining Russian objectives with respect to a regime? I can only guess, but there's nobody really credible in Syrian politics who could replace Assad. Uh, Assad's re entire regime and his father's regime before his was based on wiping out anybody who could pose such a challenge or possibly serve as a replacement. I, I'm reminded of Mubarak's regime in Egypt in which the Constitution provided for as many as six vice presidents, and he simply never appointed one because of what happened after the, the assassination of Sadat. If there's no vice president waiting in the wings, no one can take over. So I think he probably accepts Assad as you know, the best of a any possible option. Uh, th th there's nothing else credible to put in his place, so Let's just leave him there, and even if he's not perfect, and no one, I think, would claim that Bashar al-Assad is by any means perfect, uh, this is something that we, we need to deal with and, and support. But the Russians must understand that their support of a minority regime these many years and their own role in killing thousands of Syrians with their own airstrikes, hundreds, thousands of Syrians, may have prejudged their role in Syria for a long time to come, or am I not correct? No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the problems here is that Assad, because of the situation, Assad has a considerable amount of power vis-a-vis -vis Moscow, despite being under enormous threat in his own country. He can object to Russian policy when he wants to and does. Uh, he can tell the Russians what not to do. Uh, he can probably resist these Russian ideas of creating autonomous zones within Syrian territory, something that's very much against his interests as the national leader, and know that there's, since there's no adequate replacement, the Russians have to deal with it. And as for the Russians themselves, have they painted themselves into a corner? Yeah, I think m m not just by supporting the Alawites or by supporting Assad personally, but also by defending their presence in Syria. A, a naval base in Latvia, the only Russian base outside the former Soviet Union, is their major and it was their major ambition for intervening in the first place, for supporting Assad in the first place, and keeping that position going is something that's weighed them down very considerably. It's prevented any kind of consideration 
of any respect of the solution. It's driven them to a massive military intervention that's opposed just about everywhere else in the world and widely within the region, even if it did give this, create this sort of illusion of strength. And I think they're just stuck with this. They're, they're, there's really no, no way out from supporting Bashar al-Assad w- without losing an enormous amount of their prestige. Mm. Thank you. Robin, a couple for you. If we walk from the JCPOA, how, how is that going to influence Iranian behavior um, in Syria? Well, the JCPOA was always designed to be the first step in a broader strategy that was to include uh, eventual engagement with Iran in a multilateral forum to deal with uh, regional issues of uh, issues of common concern, Syria being at the top of the list. And there had been some very tentative discussions on the sidelines of the JCPOA about, you know, talking. And then the Americans organized that was 17 party talks. Um, that included the Iranians, and I think that was uh, that everyone thought that was a track that could then develop. Th- needless to say, if the U.S. walks away from the JCPOA, it not only unravels the potential for any progress on that front, but it also builds in an incentive for Iran to counter U.S. interests, and particularly because the United States has taken a stand on the side of the Saudis so visibly, most important pillar outside of Israel, that uh, you could see the real danger that we're back into the period of the 80s when I lived in Beirut and there was this tension between a young, zealous revolutionary regime and the United States. I also wanted to address the the issue that you asked Paul about, because I was going to make the point that we all look at the future of Syria in terms of who has achieved what military gains. Where at the end of the day, the real determinant that has surprised everyone is the fact that there has been no single opposition figure who has emerged as an alternative. We don't even have an Ahmed Chalabi type person in Syria. A- and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and as a result, uh, that, that has helped Assad enormously. Both the Iranian foreign minister and top Russian officials have said to me when I've said, you really want to invest on Assad, and, a lo- and I think Paul will agree, the, neither country likes Assad. He's not his father. He's not a visionary, whether you like his vision or not. This is a guy who's an ophthalmologist, who's not a deep thinker, who's been swayed by, or initially was, by his father's advisors. He's not a, a, a big thinker. He's, he's just trying to survive. And, and both the Russians and the Iranians will say, and what's your alternative? What have you come up with? So this is a factor, I think, that's tremendously important that we don't invest enough time in because the opposition has been feckless, divided, egotistical in terms of who should have the power. They can't come up with a common agenda. And the rule of thumb on the ground is if a dictator can hold 30 percent of a population, he has enough to staff, staff his police, his civil service, his military, and that's all he really needs to survive. And Assad has done that in part because there, there isn't a lot of attraction. The Kurds are the only people who have provided, whether it's a military force or some leadership. And as a result, and of course the Kurds are a separate entity, always have been to the Arabs in Syria. And so they're not an alternative. One more for you. On how does Syria play in Iranian internal politics? During recent protests, I mean, I could never really understand whether or not this notion that you, the regime, are squandering our resources and our assets on foreign military ventures. Does that resonate? And does it matter even if it does resonate? It resonates enormously, with a caveat, though. Uh, the protests in late December and January, you saw the, you know, um, invest in me, not in Gaza and Lebanon. You know, it was always, it was about economic issues and the fact that these basic, these core economic problems that that nudge the didn't force but did nudge the regime into negotiations on a nuclear deal um, play out now and of course th- it will be impacted further if not only the nuclear deal implodes or erodes but also if there isn't the kind of investment that creates job for a burgeoning population so uh, that will be tremendously important but at the same time Persian nationalism is very strong, even among a young generation that that born after the revolution and doesn't feel that commitment to the system, that 
there is a real pride and a sense of whether it's the Sh they're a Shiite minority, they're an Indo-European minority, the Arans is that where from, what's from whence Iran got its name, that as a minority, they want to make sure that Iran is protected and that they won't have to fight another war as they did with the Sunni regime of Saddam Hussein uh, after they were invaded. As Iranians like to point out, they haven't invaded anybody in over 200 years. And, and so it is that defense mentality, that minority mentality that defines what they want. They would like to see a friendly, I think the majority would like to see a friendly regime in Syria. Do they think it's worth the price? I think a lot of people are unhappy, um, but there's a, we, we need to understand all the factors that weigh into national sentiment right now, not just the obvious ones. Thanks. Amy, for you, um, to what degree do we, that is to say the United States, the Trump administration, um, factor significantly in what appears to be Erdogan's new risk readiness to assert his influence uh, and actually deploy troops. Are we the driving force that triggered the Kurdish gains, Kurdish group thoughts of Kurdish independence? What what was it, do you think? So, I mean, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, I think that if we look at the more immediate causes for this um, for this intervention in, in January. Um, you know, some people would point to Tillerson's speech at Stanford where he was talking about U.S. cooperation with the SDF providing security to that region. I mean, you know, that, that Turkey thought, okay, now the United States is not just in a tactical relationship with the SDF. We're not just, you know, defeating the Islamic State, but we're going to somehow provide security to this Kurdish region or this autonomous region, um, which is, you know, by some estimates, 25% of Syria now. Um, <coughs> which extends actually far beyond just the Kurdish region in the north, right? But it goes all down the eastern side. Um, and, you know, but I actually think, and this might sound crazy, but, <laughs> but we, if we, ha we have to think about, <laughs> we have to remember that of the four different parts, the four different parts of Kurdistan, or the four different countries where there are Kurdish minorities, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria, um, the country with which Erdogan and Turkey had the best relationship was the Iraqi, Iraqi Kurdistan, the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq, and that was the part of Kurdistan that was closest to becoming an independent state, and yet that is the country where Turkey had the best relations, and they were built on economic ties. They were built, built on trade relations. They were built on Turkish investment, Turkish banks, Turkish people working inside the KRG. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, I think it's not inconceivable that in the future, Turkey could come to accept the fact that there are Kurds also in Syria, that's where they live, that's their homeland, and they have some autonomy from Damascus. You know, I, I, and I think this would be the, you know, a peaceful resolution to this problem that Erdogan accepts this. I mean, you know, that there is this Kurdish region in Syria and they have autonomy from Damascus and if they're not threatening, you know, Turkey, that he leaves them in, in peace, you know, and some people speculate that this is about the elections and, you know, Erdogan's attempt to um, establish a presidential system in Turkey. Um, at the beginning of his, of his, the AKP rule and, you know, Erdogan actually relied on the Kurds and he was actually granting them linguistic rights, things they had de demanded for decades. Um, if you remember in 2013, the Gezi protests, there were protests not just in Gezi Park in, in Istanbul, but in 80 different cities in Turkey, right, against, they were largely seen as protests against Erdogan. The Kurds really did not take part in them. I mean, they didn't openly call. I mean, can you imagine if the Kurds <laughs> had also sort of called for those Gezi Park protests, like what might have happened? But they didn't because this was the period of the ceasefire. Um, so uh, then, you know, basically what happened in 2015 with the parliamentary elections when for the first time the HDP, the legal political party in Turkey that got 13% of the vote, that was the first time they got more than 10% of the vote, they got into the parliament, this Kurdish party, I think Erdogan felt threatened by that. And this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons why the, peace fi uh, the ceasefire fell apart. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you kind of look at these three different countries, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, when the HDP in Turkey was too successful, when they got 13% of the vote, this triggered an aggressive 
you know, the, sw the change from the ceasefire to more more aggressive attitude towards the HDP and Kurds within Turkey who've been imprisoned, mayors of over 80 cities in Turkey are imprisoned from the HDP, when they had good relationships with the KRG, and then until the referendum when they tried to declare independence, and suddenly you also see, you know, a switch in the Turkish attitude and more, you know, um, and now also in, in, in Syria with the, um, with the Syrian Kurds. Um, but so I think the U.S. is partly, you know, we do have to, and this is what we've been trying to do, is weigh carefully our relationship with both Turkey, a NATO ally, and the Kurds. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I think that, again, what, what's going to happen with the new, you know, Secretary of State, I, I don't know, but I, we do have to, I think, weigh carefully this, this dynamic. But from Erdogan's perspective, is it possible to... Um, manage a relationship with Turkey and yet be energetically supporting um, the Syrian Kurds? I mean, I suppose the question really is why are we supporting the Syrian Kurds beyond their utility and their instrumental value in confronting ISIS? What is, what is I, I'm asking you, I, don't, I can't answer the question either, what is the point beyond preventing ISIS's return, what do we envision for Kurdish nationalism in Syria? And what does Erdogan believe we are trying to do? Well, I think there is actually a difference between, you know, you, what you mentioned, Iraq, the shadow of Iraq looms large over U.S. foreign policy towards Syria. So what's happening in Syria, this is not, you know, nation building, it's local government building, and we're not doing it. The Kurds have already done this. They have already uh, created local governments in Kobani, in Jazeera, in Afrin, which is now dissolved practically because of it's now occupied by Turkey and their um, allies on the ground. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, so politically, I'm this is sort of already happening, right, this local government that, that is not calling also for the fall of Bashar al-Assad. They, they just want to have their local government right like a, f a federal system um in um in terms of the military dimension so you know lib raqqa has been liberated other places have been liberated but there there are still <laughs> islamic state militants in syria and and pentagon has officials and the state department have already warned that they are regrouping you know partly because of what's been happening now in Afrin. I mean, the people, the, 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 some of these groups that have been, uh, you know, taking part in this Turkish um, capture of Afrin, and again, there are many different groups. I'm not going to generalize about all of them. But some of them are threatening to behead Kurds who are Muslims. But, but th they, they, they believe that the Kurds, because they promote secularism and they embrace other ethnicities and other religions, they see them as infidels, and they're threatening to, you know, behead them. I mean, so do we want the head shoppers to come back? <laughs> I mean, I don't think so. I mean, so who else are we going to sort of work with? Who else do we want to, you know, stabilize that region that now, you know, 25% of Syria is not everything, but it's something. You know, it was if, if that part of Syria could remain peaceful and stabilized, that would be a good thing for, for the United States, for Israel, for, I think, Turkey. I mean, it would be not, you know, that would be a good thing. Thank you. Okay. And then one final question, and we have uh, quite a bit of time for Q&A from the audience. Uh, two related questions. Number one, David, um, what does, to the best of your, your ability to make sense out of this, <laughs> what, does, what do the Israelis want mm -hmm. from us mm -hmm. yeah. in Syria? Sure. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, easy. Ideally, they would like the United States to do more um, to uh, cut Iran's land bridge across Syria and to reduce the extent of Iranian and Hezbollah influence in Syria. That's the ideal. Um, and that means to ideally, again, but I think they know that this, is prob this may not happen, and I would say probably won't happen, to take direct American military action as needed, not just in order to protect our forces and our friends in eastern Syria, as we did twice, but to stay there and to establish 
uh, a kind of border corridor across southern Syria that would keep Iran out. Mm -hmm. um, but since they know that this is not practical, or at least not a sure thing, at a minimum, what the Israelis want from us is simply to support Israel's, uh, or not to oppose, I mean, Israel's uh, campaign of limited military strikes against Iranian and Hezbollah targets in Syria. Okay. All right, let's, let's try some Q&A from the audience. Just please identify yourself um, down here in front. Alexander Naumov of George Mason University. I want to ask about the connection between Russia and ISIS. So why exactly have has their targeting been so disproportionate with the relative to the opposition groups, given that ISIS has identified Russia as an enemy on the same way that the United States is? Russia is close geographically. They have a much <coughs> larger Muslim population than the United States does. So it seems like a core national interest for them. So why aren't they? Is it because of a capability? Like, do they have the forces to spare to attack ISIS on the same level they've been attacking other groups? <laughs> so, and given, like, how much, how important that is in their patriotic narrative, like, you see it on the TV channels all the time, they always talk about how much they're doing to fight ISIS, then why ar aren't they doing that? Right, let's take three, let's take three. Paul, that one's right. for you. All right, okay. just keep, keep, it, keep track of that one. Way in the back. Question for Rob. Thank you. Um, how have the Russian reacted, Robin, to the peace process that the Iranian have been pushing for Syria? And what is the agenda going to be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow when Putin, Erdogan, and Rouhani are going to meet in Turkey? What was the first half of the question? I couldn't hear you, Holly. Sorry, I said, how have the Russian reacted to the proposals that the Iranian have had on the table regarding peace in Syria? That's Rob been asked discussed probably several times with Gary. Let's take one more and just answer that one. Uh, that's from Hala with uh, Ms. Beer. We're running short on time. Uh, third question, right here, yes. I'm Sida Mohammed from the Syria. Actually, I'm from Afrin, north of Syria. I'm, I'm the uh, representative of Syrian Democratic Council, United States. I'm just asking here about the role of Turkey in complicated more and more the Syrian issue, especially at the this recently when uh, invading and occupying a Syrian territory, especially Afrin and the other also like Jarablus and these places. And now they are beheading to Limbej and threatening to all the Syrian, north of Syria border till the Iraqi uh, border. So what do you think? Is it for the interest of United States to have like that? Because in this case, they are increasing the issue of Russian also and Iranian also in Syria. So what is the, the, what's the solution, do you think? Especially after Mr. Uh, Donald Trump, when he declared withdrawing the uh, US uh, uh, army from Syria. What do you think about it? Thank you so much. Great, so let's do those three. Paul, on ISIS. All right, so to start with ISIS, uh, Russia certainly did attack a lot of ISIS targets, but it also attacked the Free Syrian Army. It attacked all of the other opponents of Assad, or almost all the other major ones. I think because um, you know, Russia certainly does not like ISIS, it is an existential threat to Russia. There are ISIS-aligned people in the North Caucasus who have created all kinds of problems for the Russians. But I think in Syria particularly, the major overarching case is that they really want to protect Assad's regime. So attacking anyone who opposes that regime militarily, especially agents of other governments or agents who are receiving support from the United States is something that they'd very much want to do. And yes, it's true, the state media does focus on that as ISIS. They did use the word crusade. They had the patriarch come out and talk about this in religious terms. Um, but nevertheless, 
if you actually look at the combat operations, and you can find that all over the place since September 2015 when the intervention began, a large number of the attacks are on non-ISIS ta uh, targets, and the reason is quite clear. They want to protect Assad from any kind of attack, right, and, and, and any, any uh, armed opposition. So they extended that mission very broadly and, again, very quickly. Like within a few hours of the first strikes, they were going after non-ISIS people. Robin. Uh, how do the Russians react to the Iranian plan? Look, the four points of the Iranian plan will form the basis of any kind of peace deal, whether it's uh, an immediate ceasefire, humanitarian aid, writing a new constitution, a, co a transition government, a UN-run uh, election. But it is, because it's an idea from Iran, it's kind of anathema to those who don't like Iran's role in the region. Uh, I, I think the, Syrian, the, the Russians have kind of supported the idea. They, they talk often as one, even though I think they have, there's some real differences that are likely to come out in the future. In terms of the agenda between Turkey, Iran, and Russia, one of the most interesting dynamics of the, Syria, the Syrian tragedy is that the, none of the alliances have been very effective in either uh, holding together or, uh, but, the, but the, the Troika has been far more effective, and their peace process has overtaken the UN-backed process. It is now seen as a kind of preliminary step. But they are still odd fellows, and uh, Turkey being the, odd, the most odd fellow out of this relationship. And I think, um, you know, there are, needless to say, disagreements about what Turkey's doing now in, in the north. Uh, I, I would love to be a, a fly on the wall, but for the time being, because everybody else is even more divided, it's the one thing, I, they, they're more effective uh, in achieving their goals than whether it's the U.S. and its allies or, you know, uh, anyone else in the region. Robin, thanks. Uh, Amy, briefly, uh, I guess the question is, is Turkey, <laughs> is Turkey playing a helpful role now? <laughs> well, in my opinion, the answer to that is no. I mean, yeah. um, I, I, I'm, I, again, again I, th I find it shocking. You know, there are American troops in Mandij and Erdogan is threatening <laughs> to intervene in Mandij, and he's, you know, been saying this for two months now. Now, you know, maybe it's just a threat. Maybe he's not going to do it. Maybe, you know, if the American troops would leave Mandij, you know, I don't know. This would, but I, you know, it's kind of shocking that a NATO ally uses this kind of language with, um, with the United States. Um, I, you know, I think there are divisions between maybe State Department, Department of Defense, White House. This is possibly why there hasn't been a better response to this. Um, uh, you know, I've been studying U.S.-Turkish relations for my PhD since the end of World War II, and I mean, this is quite a serious crisis. I mean, the last thing I can remember was 2003 intervention in Iraq, and, and that was when Turkey did not allow the United States to use military bases in Turkey to invade Iraq. We now have Turkey intervening, you know, in Syria and threatening <laughs> American, you know, troops in Manbij. So yeah. it's really quite a whole other level of, yeah, in response to the question about Mr. Trump withdrawing American forces, I, I mean, I, I think it's impossible to, to, to provide an authoritative answer. I would only say that w what is clear in, the, in a year plus is that Mr. Trump is determined to not to become or, or to become the un-Obama. And that would mean, in my judgment, which is my answer, we will not withdraw our forces from Syria um, because doing that, um, we're going to be in Iraq for many years to come, in Afghanistan for many years to come, and I suspect in Syria as well, because this president is not going to want the responsibility, the public relations disaster, uh, for a precipitous withdrawal from Syria, even though it's not clear to me, frankly, <laughs> what is the strategic purpose um, other than the narrowly focused mission of, of ISIS of maintaining 2,000 American forces and nine FSOs uh, and, and believing we could have a significant impact on shaping the future of the battlefield or this, or this country's political future. We have time for a couple more, I hope. Uh, yes, down here. Uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel Analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I hear that Trump has not signed Executive Order 12333. And so I'd like uh, those of you who would be willing or daring to step outside the box and tell me what would happen if, in fact, uh, Assad was assassinated. Uh, how would the regional players react? 
Well, it's a okay. fascinating <laughs> question. I, I, let's take one. Let's take one more, and then we can noodle <laughs> on how we're going to answer that one. Yes, uh, Marina. Marina Ottawa Wilson Center. Uh, <coughs> listening to all of you, it seems every country involved in the five countries involved in the in uh, uh, Syria. Nobody wants to divide Syria to tear Syria apart. Uh, there are various plans on how to proceed. Uh, the you know the the Geneva plan, uh, the, the Iranians, etc., etc., etc. So she. Uh, at the same time, it seemed to me that all the countries with their kind of very limited goals and sometimes very unclear goals are also following uh, policies that make it impossible for Syria to be put back together. <laughs> and this is, I'd like uh, you know, mm. some comments on that because it seemed to me that the more uh, militias, the more groups, the more actors, the more weapons to different groups, Every all the outsiders are putting in, the least uh, possible it becomes for Syria to stay together. Can I weigh in? For sure. Which, which one? I, I'd weigh in very briefly on both of them. First of all, uh, if, if Assad uh, is assassinated, you know, one of the big dangers for Assad is that he survives. And because in many ways, he may be more vulnerable in peacetime than he was in wartime when he had everybody standing with him. So, uh, you know, who's going to come to his rescue? Who's going to rebuild the country? And I think there are a lot of questions. Um, on Marina's very good question, I agree with you. No one wants, everybody's, the one thing everybody agrees on, every country, every party, they want to hold Syria together. But it's a little bit like Iraq. And the former Iraqi ambassador said the only people who want to hold Iraq together are those who don't live in Iraq. And I think that applies to Syria to some degree as well. And the danger is that after seven years of whether it's ethnic cleansing, um, displaced people, you've got a, a quarter of the population that now lives outside the country, more than half is displaced, that um, the, the, the revenge element, as someone who lived in Lebanon for five years of the Civil War, you know, that it's that that finding a formula that will hold Syria together with a strong central government is, I think, illusory. And of course, as the strategic center of the Middle East, Syria, whatever happens in Syria will ripple, as we've already seen, across the whole region. We ought to take that big question much more seriously. But I'm with you. I, I think there's a real danger. And it's not like we're going to have you know, a revolution or just an assassination. I think the, the greater danger is that you, you can't rebuild the country as it was, that there's no alternative leadership. Assad is not a very effective leader. The outside world doesn't do very much to rebuild this country. And that you see, you know, the Somaliization in a different way uh, of Syria that, that haunts us for years to come. If you look what happened in Libya, in eight months you, had, you went from having an, a, a totalitarian government to having you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of militias with only six million people. And you see what we've seen in Syria with over a thousand militias. A lot of them are just neighborhoods. I interviewed 31 commanders from Aleppo once. And, and they were all, they couldn't get together just in their part of Aleppo to create a unified high command. They were all about their neighborhood who had control and so forth. And that we could see this phenomena across Syria. And that's why I really worry that in addressing all these questions about Syria right now and what the international, that we're not looking at the biggest one. Just one thought on Assad. I, I, I can only say that uh, given this president's seemingly preternatural determination to accord Mr. Putin an enormous amount of political safe space for reasons that are not clear to me and are not driven by a, a logic of foreign policy, I would think that the last thing he would want to do would be to remove what Paul would argue and I would agree is a central feature of the Russian enterprise in Syria. Not my question. Assad has a heart attack. What happens then? Oh, okay. So well, I think you, yeah, you can I try that. You all right. Spend, I, you, I, you know, it, you it just I'll try to be very brief. I, I was an early on during the Syrian uprising after about a year of mass casualties by inflicted by the regime against its own people. I was put on the spot on C-SPAN, just like I am now, I guess, uh, with exactly that question. Why doesn't somebody order a drone strike and just take Assad out? And I said, I think that would be great. 
And um, I still think so. But I don't think it would solve the problem. I think it would just be a kind of poetic justice. Uh, and I think that Syria would still, unfortunately, be even more militarized and controlled uh, by outside powers and by some new version of a despotic regime. So yep. the problem is not, unfortunately, only Assad personally, although he's responsible for genocide. Um, <coughs> on the question of, uh, somebody else raised the question about, what was that other question that was very Future interesting? Future Syria. The, the yes, is Syria gonna be Marina's question? A united country, I, I actually, I disagree with the sentiment that Syria is falling apart. Um, I think the regime is taking control over more and more of the country. And that's the future trajectory of Syria, uh, supported by uh, Iran and Russia and Hezbollah and hundreds of thousands of Shiite militia fighters from outside the country. But the regime will, if, as things are going, will take over more and more of the country, except for probably some more peripheral areas in which the Kurds will maintain de facto local autonomy and some corners of the country near the Israeli and Jordanian borders in which I think probably Israel and Jordan uh, tacitly supported by the United States and Russia may succeed in preventing the regime for establishing full control. Can I give it a try now? Sure. All right. Ask, we'll go give the last word to you. All right. What happens if Assad drops dead? I think you'll probably get a post-Stalin situation where, you, if you saw the funny movie, uh, where all of the different satraps in the government try and arrange some sort of collective leadership. You'll probably have some sort of Syrian version of the junta, the top Alawite generals and more distant relatives of Assad uh, get together and try to create a collective leadership. And whether that would be as effective as one person doing all, all the decisions, I, I don't know, um, but that's something we might possibly find out if he signs the executive order or if something else should happen. Uh, what about the country? I think Syria now is more stable, at least in terms of its national government, than it has been at any time really in the past six or seven years. And um, again, the, the whether it collapses as a national entity, I think is very doubtful. And one barometer I have of that living as I do in Beirut is that um, as Syria becomes relatively more stable, Lebanon becomes relatively less stable. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in 10 years, we now have militia clashes in Beirut. We haven't had that since 2008. Mm. And now we have the different factionalized uh, versions of Lebanese politics coming out more militantly. Uh, we're looking now in May at the first parliamentary election since 2009 after an illegal, constitutionally illegal extension of the current parliament's mandate. Uh, that could be very, very dangerous, and there's a very restive civil society over all sorts of issues affecting Lebanon domestically, uh, which could very much tend toward greater instability. But I think one of the kind of ironies here was that when Syria was a real mess, all of the Lebanese factions got together, and you, know, you had Nasrallah on television talking about how he loves peace and wants everyone to live peacefully with each other, and it's a bit hard to believe. But if his connections to Iran and his resupplies from Iran are disrupted and he's sending thousands of his fighters to die to defend Bashar al-Assad, then, of course, he has a certain amount of reason to do that. So I think as, as Syria becomes more stable, you'll see actually Lebanon mm -hmm. moving toward crisis. Fascinating insight. And please uh, join me in thanking our panel for a <laughs> terrific presentation.